we are starting our seminar session with uh, Peter Sexenmar and uh, Matthias from Culture uh, Republic. Kunst Republic, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> and um, we start with a short lecture of Peter Sexenmar. He is an expert and, um, um, and he also chief executive of uh, information management uh, consultant company uh, which is based in Switzerland and um, he's also teaching in different universities in UK, um, Germany and outside uh, Europe but including Brandenburg Technical University, it's nice to know him and um, organization is an important thing and in the modern world because um, um, as you may know, it's not a big secret right? that uh, um, it's more about two billion people which will be uh, living in uh, cities, uh, megapolises, uh, Latin America, India, and um, Africa. And uh, the interesting question how to involve community and how to make a uh, um, city uh, smart, and that's why. I just have a question. Everyone's only in this seminar, and there's two other seminars happening at the same time. So I don't know if anybody would actually like to go to the other seminars as well. <laughs> um, otherwise, I mean, you can. You're welcome to stay here, of course. Um, but uh, I think the other ones have also really great speakers. So. Um, we're going to live stream them, but I just wanted to announce that. So yeah. there's a curation one about Documenta and Biennales. I'm not trying to take your audience away, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then music uh, about um, archiving in England and South Korean performance art. So, um, yeah, curation one, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I just, uh, I just uh, the funny friendship has already expired. <laughs> Okay, cool. Okay, you continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the ultimate threat. <laughs> that's how marketing companies are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, shall we go upstairs and get some? Good thinking, Matthias. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. I will continue. Oh, that's that's here. Yeah, and we'll start. Great, perfect. <laughs> now, for the last five years, I've been conducting research on cities. As some of you, especially among my um, wonderful young, but they call them old students, uh, old students know I have all my life bridged both academe and the world of enterprise. And, um, and in the world of enterprise, I'm a hardcore techie. And academe, I'm, I'm a bit split with this terrible appendix. BTU, where I'm supposed to be soft and wonderful. Um, <coughs> good. But as I said, for the last, I, I, I'm in, in Germany, <coughs> I'm a member of the National Academy for Science and Engineering. And as part of the Academy's work, I've been conducting research with India and China on smart cities for the last few years. I'll come to that in a moment, but I want to tell you a bit of the background. Uh, the discussion. And, and of course, Anastasia has very uh, uh, properly stated, and that takes care of my first two slides, um, that of course we live in an age of unbelievable urbanization. Um, and to me, to me, now there's a, a personal bit there as well, which you might find strange, but I want to explain to you. I'm somebody who likes complexity. I don't like simple situations. Complexity means you have work to do. Simple situations mean there's no work for you. So, and I like to have work to do. And I looked for an area that was both complex, brought together many disciplines, and provided me with a 20 year roadmap for my professional life. And I found cities. Now, in, in the old days, people used to say that organizations, companies, are the most complex human organisms that we know, systems that we know. This is no longer true. Cities are the most complex systems that we know. And since 
uh, we anticipate that about 80% of mankind will live in city over, that is over the next 20 years, which is not a banal statement because that means 2 billion people will have to move into these cities during that period. Um, because we believe that this is going to happen, cities are utterly and totally appealing because they have that anyway. They're an interesting form, a system to explore and work with, etc. Now, in my work, in my life work, which is of of course, like so many things, is not delineated by academic disciplines, luckily, uh, but has a certain holistic aspect to it. I've, I've realized that a techie approach to cities is not the approach that works if you want cities that are worth living in, uh, that are appealing to their inhabitants, uh, that are safe and secure to people. I'll come to a little uh, distinction between Europe and other places in a moment. So uh, I've moved away and persistently in the last five years, whenever my uh, compatriots talked about even greater fine tuning of sensor based environments, Internet of Things, etc., like that, I've always persistently insisted that I do a talk at the self same conference about the human aspects of cities, of which there are many, right? Now, one thing that, um, well, let me come to that little distinction. Um, working on cities is not, of course, there, there, there is, if you, if you look up uh, documentation, etc., you know that there is an art of creating a Roman city, a Greek city, and these are forms that are there at the time, not only in hindsight. Uh, Europe has only bothered with all kinds of aspects of the city uh, for the last 150 years. Um, as part of the Industrial Revolution, uh, England was the first country to experience the brunt, the onslaught of migrant workers from the countryside into the city, into the manufacturing bases. And, um, and a lot of the city planning stuff that you see today, like garden cities and all that kind of jazz, was created at that time as a reaction to the abysmal situation in which people found themselves in cities. <clears throat> One thing that you don't, perhaps don't know is that during the major industrial period in Berlin, now, major industrial period in Berlin, ah, can't be now, um, uh, let's say 1890, there was a situation in central Berlin where something like 24 workers slept to one room. And a lot of the stuff like the Gropius city, uh, etc., are reactions to offset that utterly impossible situation, which led to a lot of unpleasant stuff about which we don't read today, but believe me, the police were fiercer than, than they are today. <coughs> uh, we had similar situations in the 1930s, um, uh, in New York and Chicago when workers' unrest was put down with brute force, army and police. So, and um, now, now, so the background to my talk is, I'd like to help with the talk, I'm glad for every participant. <laughs> and latecomers get a special treat at the moment. So, uh, lately, I've come to, you know, you, you end up in situations where people think, yeah, how can we make money with this? And, uh, and, and, and people want to make money out of the changes in the cities in all places, in the, in the exploding cities in the southern hemisphere, and they want to make money in the slowly transforming cities in Europe. And one bit that uh, I, I've come across, and it's one of my uh, recent projects, um, um, we, we are glad to have you here. You can also go upstairs, of course, just to give everybody a chance. But we have several chairs here, and you're most welcome. And if you're shy, I'll take the chairs to the back. <laughs> Yeah. Come, come. 
but yes, you know, I have the great advantage of having at least half a dozen, if not more, of my former students here. So they smile at me. Okay, it's family. Yeah, <laughs> out of habit. Out of habit. Yeah, out of habit. So don't. Uh, we heard it all before. <laughs> <laughs> you were always up, you know. <laughs> I go <got> upstairs. <laughs> no, 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 stay, stay, stay. Um, so, so recently, I came across. Uh, a project, and I'm pursuing this project, which tries to find ways of making cities safer and more secure for inhabitants. Because I'm not talking about uh, engaging policemen, I'm not talking about more video cameras, I'm, I'm talking about a, a variety of things that involve technology, uh, processes and management, but also people. And when I was asked to come here, I thought, yeah, one of the things that is so important for creating a sense of community and a sense of identity, which is uh, an outcome of, of that, uh, and which leads to incredibly beneficial behavioral uh, um, results, is identity. If you manage to make a place your own, if you develop ownership, identity is a great way to deal within the city. So, let me explain to you why I came. No, let me not. Let, let me romanticize. Why not? A few years ago, I worked in the information factory of Credit Suisse, big Swiss bank. Now you must know that my real life is I'm a computer professor. So, okay. Now, so I I worked in this bank and I had a an administrative assistant. No, an assistant called Casper. Now Casper was a very righteous and ecologically correct and also very nice Swiss person. Um, and so, um, you, you, you know pet uh, uh, bottles from which you drink water? The, uh, it, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the abbreviation for the chemical composition is PET. And PET bottles in Germany go into a recycling mechanism. In Switzerland you flatten them and throw them into a special PET bottle container. Right. So I used to, so we sat in the bank, big place, 7,000 people worked in the IT alone in one building, right? <coughs> I was on floor 7, which was sort of not quite prestigious, but uh, we had daylight, sex floor down, no. <laughs> so, <coughs> so I, uh, do I have one? No, I don't. So I sat, uh, I had made my uh, better of a place, you know, huge office, I made sure I had a, a vase with roses on my, on my desk and I put my own carpet in because I thought, well, with you and your uniform appearance. So, so I had this pet bottle. So I go, there's a bank of refuse bin behind me, small ones for me, not big ones. I go, right, and I throw my pet bottle. Casper gets up. You know, he goes to my pet bottle, he lifts it and puts it in. So I go, okay. Not long from now, another pet bottle flies in the general direction of a bin. Casper gets up, <laughs> lifts his bottle, puts it in the right place. Asshole. I say, no excuse you have. It's a society where you say things directly. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> Next bottle goes. Casper gets up, puts it in. I shout at him. Now, what happens with the fourth bottle? <coughs> it goes in the right bin, right? Because Casper had taken ownership of the environment. As a good Swiss person, he knew what to do. And he had made certain that he had educated me as to what I should do. And from now on, when in Switzerland, <coughs> Hold the pet bottle, go to the pet bottle container, put it in, right? So uh, this is all we need. Okay. And so when, whenever people tell me about behavior that they want to enforce with video cameras or sensor, thousands of sensors, whatever, I tell them they need to organize people, create a sense of community, a sense of ownership, and then we can do something. We can still use the sensors. And so let me start with my talk. I've talked about urbanization 
uh, you've all seen those huge uh, big places. I'm sure the uh, uh, understand that the thing will be uh, somewhere on the on the internet. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the. And also on each yeah. yeah. Now let me go from this generality about the uh, emerging uh, urban centres and, and the most important the most important sentence. Uh, is at the bottom here. For the most important thing that is here, cities are becoming more important than countries. That's the only one you might need to take away from that. Now, let me quickly come to this other concept of the smart city. The smart city thing was driven very largely by technologists. And you can see it in the identification of what they saw. Uh, um, IBM, Cisco, and all those companies are unbelievably interested in this emerging market of the cities where they can earn more and more money uh, because more and more people come into the cities, lots of economic activity, and so they designed this thing as smart cities, uh, little sidelines. The Chinese call them intelligent cities because the smart cities have been asserted so much by IBM that they want another word. But when you see intelligent or smart cities, this is the beginning of them, and people very early on uh, identified six categories, smart economy, smart mobility, smart environment, smart people, smart living, smart governance, and I've sometimes added a little smart, but never mind. Um, but generally, this is what they see, and it, um, if, if you note down my uh, email address, which is at the bottom of every slide, of course you can have this presentation. Also individually, all right? Just trigger me with an email. So, from these smart city ideas, uh, let me quickly show you. Now, how does that work? It works, yeah. You, you, you see, um, so, so here you have an entirely populated wheel of what a smart city idea is. Uh, as of three years from before, right? Um, you have the smart city, then you have those indicators. Let's go to one that I can read particularly well. Smart environment, so green buildings, green energy, green urban planning. Right? So you have, and people have constructed unbelievable uh, indicator uh, uh, um, uh, buildings, systems, sometimes with 270 indicators to show you how far your city has gone in being a smart city. Uh, let me take another one, um, but you get the general gist, you know, smart economy, you have entrepreneurs, innovation, you have productivity, local and global interconnectedness, and so on. So this is a whole thing that you can look at later, just to tell you where I came from. Now, now if we're so clever, it, you know, it, there are many challenges. If we're so clever, why haven't we succeeded? And now comes the gist of my thing. The challenge is that the growth in the cities in the world cannot be met by technology alone. For those of you who are European-based, let me illustrate this with a few examples. I don't need to do it for you, because you know this very well. I, I, I go to Bangalore, which is a fairly western city, uh, but I go there three, four times a year. Now, if you look at over there, okay, if this is the city of Bangalore and, and the circle is its uh, municipal boundaries, the growth happens along the new arrivals come along the arrival routes in the city. You know, the, in the city centre, if there is a city centre, which in this case there isn't, also interesting distinction between European and other kinds of cities, but the, the, the central bits remain fairly static, but the big, big growth happens here. You know, as people come into the city, both within and outside the municipal boundaries. So, with the, oh, we've all eaten and coffee's a bit away, so, uh, so, my friend, I have a friend there, says, look at this lake at the boundary of the city. This is where 50,000 new arrivals shit every morning. 
right? So it's, it's not you know it's not about it's not about fifty. It's not about people who have just arrived in a European uh, uh, train station as part of their student uh, hike through Germany. It's fifty thousand people who've come and have a sort of temporary thing there for a few days uh, while they try to find their way a bit further into the city or into places where they can stay. <coughs> so <coughs> the problem why we or the, the challenge why we need to be concerned about this is, is people will live there, they're looking for a livable life. The promise of the city for most of them is very big, but the mega cities are also hotbeds of urban unrest, violent clashes, etc. There's a nice word that is there that people have coined for this, it's called herbicide. You know, it's a bit like homicide, suicide, <laughs> only it happens, it's the way the city goes, right? You or somebody else. And uh, so we have these deep divisions, and we see in particular just now, uh, because television brings us all these images in uh, ahead of the uh, uh, Football World Cup, we see that uh, uh, the unrest in Brazil. And of course, in a, in a city, it can bring together thousands of people very quickly. So, smart governance is another concept which people thought worked, but technology alone cannot help. People will have to be given a say, and people all over the world are looking for ways to deal with cities. And my general statement is that it's up to us whether these cities are a triumph or disaster. Now, Mr. Glazer, a book to the left, uh, has written a, a remarkable book, a very upbeat, he says, Triumph of the City, the most interesting invention that mankind ever made. Uh, but we know images uh, as to the right where we know that cities are also great disasters in many ways. So my major, so my major finding, I've brought together all the strands of my life and my exploration, my major finding is we must look at the human aspect, then we must look at spaces in the city, we must look at cohesion among people, we must look at communities, and now comes the word, we must look at common heritage, or make it common, because that's the social glue that keeps the city together. And I'm standing right in the front of the camera. Yeah. Can I ask you a favour? Yes, please. Is it possible to stand to the left? Of course. The, thank you. I will stand wherever you want. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> and this is, of course, my pretty face. <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> Good. It's just that you know I was near the button and then yeah. to push it. So now, because we need spaces, cohesion, communities, common heritage, because they create identity, a sense of belonging, and feelings of ownership. Now let me say quickly also for those of you with heritage, in this whole city discussion, heritage is a totally underdeveloped concept. Even if Matthias is making a life out of it, but uh, he you know he's, he's like a cockroach, he will <laughs> always live, you know beyond uh, all kinds of catastrophes and disasters, but I have observed that heritage plays a small, small role here, because perhaps not in Europe, oh, yeah, that's, you know, never mind. Um, but and even less elsewhere, heritage is the last thing that people think of. Sometimes, but it's the last thing that people think of. <coughs> now, Identity is the foundation of a sense of belonging. People place themselves with identity. And now, uh, a little later you'll find that this placing is not so easy in um, modern times, <coughs> because <coughs> earlier people used to define themselves because of the way where, of where they lived and of who they were. But in the digital age, and this is where my strands of my professional life come together, in the digital age, identity is not quite as simple. Uh, 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 among my children, 
uh, several play Dota. Not Dota. You're too old. You're too old. You know. Yeah. Okay. Defense of the Ancient is the original title. It's a game, a computer game which you play. You play it in teams of eight to ten people. Each game lasts for about short of an hour. You play in changing teams worldwide. Anyone can log in and become part of your team, but you play as a team. It's not exactly a local football team on the ground. It's you know just somebody. And so one of my boys tells me, yeah, you know, so and so is good. The Russians are difficult to, to, to play with language problems and so on. Uh, so you have a, suddenly you have new identities. Uh, and identities that you can't even observe. Identities that uh, uh, you have no access to. And uh, you know, I'm not trying to, and I'm sure there are other, but it's just one example. Uh, there are other things, uh, we belong to social media, things we have friends that we would have never had if there wasn't the internet. Uh, and so, so identity is suddenly quite difficult. Uh, and yet, you know, identity makes desirable behavioral outcomes. So, because I'm always asked by my students, now what the heck does that mean and does this open up a new field for me? I have tried not to answer uh, this easily. You know, there's uh, one could of course uh, talk about all kinds of things, interesting technological approaches, sociological approaches, etc. But I've tried in the next few slides to say, what can we, as a group that's interested in heritage, do research, work on, to make identity in the urban space a much more concrete thing? And I'm also answering the question never answered uh, uh, during my last uh, World Heritage uh, Management course. Now, what, what, what other things can we do for our masses, basically? Uh, so, for example, <coughs> We have to ask ourselves again, what, what role does the built environment, what do heritage elements in a city, what role do they play in the formation of identity and communality in that city? Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't have easy answers, by the way. But I'm saying it's well worth finding out. And of course, my view is always global, so I understand different patterns, different things, different everywhere. Then, the next one, uh, communities, and especially, especially the, uh, you know, should we have back the last time, a mankind experienced this kind of relationship shift was when the hunter-gatherers went to live in villages. So we're talking two or three thousand years ago. Villages make for a certain pattern. In villages you have close blood bloodlines, meaning people are related. You have relationships, you have patterns of behavior which have become traditions. Suddenly, three thousand years later, we have a situation where people move into cities. And in cities you have distant bloodlines, meaning you're not related with anybody much, right? So where do your relationships and your loyalties and uh, uh, communal assistance and your traditions come from, etc. So uh, cities, uh, villages used to have roles, sometimes even to the point where there was a caste system which uh, made your role uh, transcended generations, right? Um, all of a sudden, in cities, you're terrifically competitive. So, now comes another big wham in the middle of our moving into cities, which is the digital transformation. Meaning that uh, uh, we have network socialization, we have global economics, uh, I, I work on a concept called Industry 4.0, what I mentioned, only on demand. Um, we have immigration on top of uh, 
cities that may have grown previously from the rural area. So all of a sudden, we are in a minefield of problems which we don't know. And the interesting thing for us as heritage people is to say, what effect do all these aspects have on place attachment? Because we're human, and identity continues to be place attachment. And what is that place, right? That's uh, another one we've seen that. So, and lastly, the third question, and these are independent or they hang together, what can we do deliberately to create more identity in a city? And luckily, Matthias is here, my, my buddy, and he's going to talk about it because he does it. You know, I'm the theoretician and he is the practical person, and of course you should admire him because he is in the middle there and uh, does it. <laughs> so, if you believe that these are new questions where because of the digital transformation and because of this urban thing, you have to look at heritage differently. I've listed a whole lot of things here, but let me say first of all, in my little journey to this point, I have suddenly realized one thing that has hit me very hard. In heritage studies, we have always looked at the individual building at the individual site. Now, in this age where bigger systems emerge that encapsulate things, etc., we need to look at how they hang together in a much bigger context. Let me explain to you with a simple example, totally outside heritage. IKEA has always had green signs. Now, some of them are big, some of them are smaller. But basically, IKEA, the furniture sellers, have a pattern for a green site building, which means you enter one end, big car park, blue, yellow, Swedish colors, you enter one end, they have a complicated way to lead you through the building to achieve maximum exposure to uh, your buying impetus, yes? <laughs> For you to suffer greatly that you have so little money, always. <laughs> um, and you go out and at the end you can eat Kurt Müller and uh, ice cream, etc. Right? Now, this works Greenfield. Now, IKEA is going to do its first urban IKEA city centre site in Hamburg starting now. Yeah. And, and of course that is a totally different thing because suddenly you live in a quarter uh, of the city. You live within other shops. Uh, uh, totally different dynamics, etc. Uh, and the meaning of Ikea will change. You know, people like me will actually go and eat the Kurt Buller first and then leave again. Uh, uh, oh, whatever, right? Uh, so, similarly, if we take this example with us, in heritage studies, we need to look much more at the context. First of all, the spatial context. So, where is this thing? What is the quarter? What are the people that are around it? Much more than we used to. Uh, in order to create more identity. Uh, um, we, we perhaps also need to look at similar sites worldwide because in the age of digital transformation, people who are concerned with the self-same things form their own community, their own identity. Um, uh, and this has led me to a whole new list of um, urban research topics that a heritage person can pursue with a view to heritage and identity. Uh, so it's, uh, of course, I, I know that in, 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 at, at uh, Cottbus you've been dealing a lot with um, world heritage sites that have been, become recognized, but uh, my example is always uh, English national heritage, which has so many different sites with so many different implications. Uh, and there are a few, including that of my chosen uh, hometown, uh, which wouldn't want to be a World Heritage Site. 
because they have their own brand. In Oxford, we don't want to be a World Heritage Site. We are a heritage site and have been for a long time. We don't need a stamp or two to be that. Um, so, <clears throat> so all of a sudden, in a, but I, I, I've listed this under tangible and intangible resources. Uh, all of a sudden, you can not only look at a building or, or a site or an, in, an isolated thing, you can look at natural systems, hydrology, topography, land use patterns, spatial organization, visual relationships, vegetation, circulation, transport systems, natural constructed water features, forms of buildings, bridges, walls, tunnels, structures, up to the vocabulary, that's Matthias again, of urban art, sculpture, site furnishing, and objects. So, um, an urban-centric view of heritage suddenly opens up the, a whole new vista of possible topics to explore because they're all important because of heritage equals identity equals communality equals communal spirit. Um, similarly, similarly, in the I've listed a few things in the historical urban space which are generally considered intangible resources. So you have traditional festivals, rituals, music, dance, performance. Now in the city, in the city we have a challenge. There'll be several of them. Each. No, uh, a marriage ceremony among different communities in a city is not the same. It may be similar or it may be dramatically different. And the more these cities become like countries, the more diverse they will be. Then you have, same, same thing applies for all of these. So you have worship, pilgrimage, religious celebrations, you have iconic places. Symbols that might show that you belong together. Uh, very often, that's a very important issue in cities uh, to become proud, to take ownership, because you have a new identity, you belong to a new place. Um, then, places of memory, important events, joy, suffering, <coughs> and commemoration. We see this with the D Day. Um, I mean, the, the no nothing. Uh, nothing has created a better platform for people who've just fallen out with each other because of the dispute over the Crimea. Nothing has given a better urge of identity and communal spirit than the commemoration of the D-Day landing in Normandy um, 70 years ago. Uh, it is inevitable that faced with such an important, uh, iconic event, uh, people forget about short-term differences and remember long-term attachments. Um, I, I've brought in a picture, Matthias Kavok has many more pictures, you know, urban farming now becomes something, urban crops, uh, practices, etc. Uh, traditional arts and crafts, the local cuisine, um, for those of you who are still slim, very, uh, please explore it and tell me about the best. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, then, even up to the point where local voices, in the sense of statements about the city, uh, <coughs> values of the city, but also dialects, etc., become important. So, I've, I've listed new things that you can do in tangible and tangible resources, given that the city is becoming so important. Now, what is it? Um, that I also want to say. Transformation, I have left out the other word, digital transformation. You must realize that some people already said it today in, uh, I only came in during the Syrian presentation, so I haven't seen any others, but I'm sure others have also said things. The world is becoming both smaller and bigger, but it is also true that software is eating the world, um, as Mark Andreessen, one of the big venture capitalists, says. Now, in, when you look at the big changes that are happening because of the digital transformation of the world, we need to see what is cultural identity, what is identity 
in this particular world. So I've called this slide transformation practices because, because it goes far beyond the traditional historically orientated view of heritage. It goes into a managed heritage system where you look at the things that you can create and make in turn into heritage. So what are the major influences that create place identity, including the new connections? Is there a, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, is, do you have a new identity when you belong to a worldwide network of people who run every Sunday morning uh, at 11 o'clock and meet? And what is that? Or if you belong to Rotary, uh, um, then what are the uh, one thing that um, will change dramatically? We all have the um, we've all seen the discussion uh, about urban sprawl in the United States. In the United States, one of the major points that they make at the moment is that they don't have a city center anymore, and the city spirals out of control, out into an urban sprawl. In many Asian cities, uh, while uh, while during colonization there was something akin to a city center, uh, this has now become a relatively small park, uh, if it survives at all, and there are no centers as we know them from English-inspired, American-inspired town planning uh, of the uh, 1850s. Um, uh, and, and anyway, the question is, um, how do these things change? We, we, in, in, in Central Europe, uh, in Germany in particular, we have uh, uh, a dying out of the uh, lively city centers that we know because of internet commerce, etc. So, so there is a, a whole new aspect there which asks us, what does this identity Thing mean for the city? How do we create identity when we don't even know future urban forms? Um, interesting thing to do. Then, what stylistic decisions can we take to create community identity? Um, are there opportunities for new cultural contexts which haven't been there before? Like, you know, you, you do a flash mob, and this is, and all of a sudden, Berlin is the city of the flash mob. <laughs> Right, so people become proud because they can be part of flash mobs and organize themselves, etc. Uh, just an, uh, an idea. I'm sure there'll be many more uh, coming up. And and then, which roles and responsibilities for individuals and communi community agencies are there in shaping urban identity? There will be jobs in urban identity. So um, urban identity creation linked to urban heritage elements will be a working field of the future. Let me show you how. So, in this holistic view, heritage in the cityscape, uh, we need to find out how we as heritage people manage change and regeneration of cities. And for this we need knowledge, planning tools, non-invasive technologies. Uh, every heritage student should have a, a crash course in geographical information systems and 3D representation. Not only in project management, as I said five or ten years ago. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, we have, we have. You know, I'm, I'm through. Then we need tools and knowledge in participatory collaborative partnering. We need tools for civic um, engagement. Uh, at the moment we would think web-based social media, but I'm sure there will be also new ones in the future. We need public forums, chat rooms, blogs. We need skill development to interact in the community as part of the skills for heritage management. Um, we need to know a lot about how we maintain and augment quality of life, uh, a sustainable urban, uh, urban environment with regulatory system, financial tools, legislation. How do we become stewards of heritage in the city? 
Uh, how do we document heritage? Which multimedia do you use? So there's a whole new world there in that, in those three steps that I've used. I've told you cities are happening, most complex systems. Heritage is under development, underdeveloped there. Lots of things to be done. First step, cities open up a whole new area for us to look at. Next and final step for the moment. And we have the terrific challenge of the digital transformation, which changes everything again, but gives us an unbelievably good opportunity to develop the scope of heritage work. Good. Matthias. Thank you. to work in and to exhibit and to do our project. So uh, that was the reason why we started looking for a place like this. And now we're sort of working out on a more uh, stable base. But we as a collective are working all over the city of Berlin, but also in other cities. So we're doing projects in, we've done projects in India, Indonesia, in uh, the US, and of course in Berlin. Right now we're working a lot in the Ruhr area, which is like the former industrial kind of heart of Germany, which is going through a phase of massive transformation, or has been going through a phase of massive transformation for the last 40 years, I would say, but they're getting more desperate now, so now they're asking the artists to come up with some ideas. And I think there's somebody coming. It's one way. It should be soon, in one minute. Okay, cool. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, yeah, it's no problem. <laughs> and and how, how do you, how do you, uh, what triggers people to ask you to do something for them? Well, uh, various reasons. Um, like in the rural area, for example, um, there is a certain cluelessness. They don't know how the transformation process shall continue because the, the kind of steps they have taken have not proved to be be very successful, there's a, a, still a huge rate of unemployment, and in a sense there is a lack of fantasy, what, how things could develop in a different way. And also there, there is of course like a, a huge identity crisis, the, um, and you know, so I think that's a very important point. The identity of the rural area is an industrial sort of identity. These People work in big factories are the deindustrialized these are deindustrialized parts of Germany. Yes. Which you now declare rural. Yeah. That's right. Yes, yeah, you now declare. Which you now declare to be rural. No, rural. No, that's rural. Uh, but, but that's oh, the rural. Rural. Yeah. Rural. Yeah. Oh, rural. 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 Yeah. 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 Rural.
It's like, it's a bird life. And, <laughs> and it's, the city of Germany. it's the biggest city of Germany, that's what they like to say. They talk about a metropolitan area, but it's something in between. You have like 20 bigger cities, mid-sized cities, and all within like 100 by 60 kilometers, and they're all somehow very close to one another. And they used to live from the industry, and now they, you know, don't have the classical, that kind of classical way of, of labor anymore. And so now they're looking for, you know, something to do else with their time and their resources. I'll show you some of these projects. And as you were talking, actually, I, I, I just changed my, my overall presentation. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I still need it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I will just jump across a few projects. I'll, I'll do an emphasis on other projects. Um, okay, but things are developing here. Perfect. Um, just give me a second so I can set up the technology. <clears throat> Matthias, you disappoint me. Yeah. I've been yearning to have a Mac. I had the first, I had bought the first Mac many years ago. Yes. And now, you know, after the decades, I've been yearning to have a Mac Air latest, da, 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 and now I realize it's not all it's made up to be. No, actually, I'm going to change. I'm going away from the Mac world. Um, yeah, it's changed. It used to be this kind of nerdy. Got, you know, it's kind of nerdy people have yeah, hacks. Culture loves hacks, kind of, yeah. No, and now it's, you know, it's just really the way that my PC people are yeah. the and, um, and, um, yeah. and, um, yes. Ask somebody to, yeah, to the technology while we're It's okay. Um, I, I can now start, I think. Start your viewer, let's see if it's in the right order. What? Oh, well, okay, great. So now, um, cultural projects, and I want to give you some examples, and uh, as I said, uh, I think identity plays a big role in what we are doing, like creating identity, creating representation for people that are usually not represented in the city, and, um, and the starting point for this, and for our activity as First Republic Collective, is this Uptumpa Berlin Centrum project which started in 2006 in the center of Berlin, in the former military <coughs> zone dividing East and West Berlin. And basically the starting point is this very aerial picture, which all we did was we tilted this kind of wasteland, which used to be this kind of zone dividing East and West wow. Berlin. We tilted it red and basically approached different funding organizations said like, well actually we've got a space out here which we would like to realize projects in. And we didn't have any permissions uh, for that space, but we just like basically um, pretended that we have some kind of cultural ownership for this. And basically, from that point on, we got a lot of funding just by stating that and realized projects. This place, basically, when we arrived in 2006, looked like this. It still, in parts, look, uh, looks like that. But now, since Berlin is developing really quickly, um, and maybe there's a, a lot of construction going on in many spaces. So, <clears throat> first thing that we saw there are these fences. Then the first thing that we did was to see, actually, why are these fences there? We found out that basically there's that various lots. They belong to different people. And um, so we had to talk to different people to get the permissions to work there. And then we dug into the history a little bit and to find out actually what's kind of the history of the space in general because all the projects that we do, and I find this is very important for us, 
are site specific. They work with all the parameters that you find on a specific site, the history of the space, all the different stakeholders of that space, ownership issues, political pressure, and, uh, and so this is really very, very important. Otherwise, we couldn't develop projects. We are not like an artist collector that does stuff somewhere and then drops it somewhere. We work with all these kind of things that we find. So history is a big point, because if you understand the history, it's much easier to actually to talk to people who have lived there, because they also know the history. So we really dug deep into the history, and we actually found um, that the, the Skulpturen Park area was right here on the border of the old city of Berlin. This is the old city of Berlin. And the rural area is the border zone, which is kind of, in kind of interesting. And then basically, now what we did here, we took the uh, medieval wall dividing the city of Berlin in the rural area and mapped it onto where we were working. And you see here, this is the Skulpturen Park. I showed you the area before. This is the area. So, and then we also found this really beautiful uh, picture, which is the Leipziger Tor, and right behind here, there's like the Skulpturen Park. And the city of Berlin developed and grew, became bigger, and basically the old medieval city, you know, just disappeared more or less, because around it, the city um, um, became, the rural area became a city. And by <coughs> the late 19th century, this area looked like this. And and here, that's like one of the buildings that is used to be where the uh, uh, wasteland is today. With the Second World War, all this area was destroyed, and the area was made a buffer zone between the four different sectors. The Berlin was divided into four sectors, and um, this became a buffer zone. So basically, the border, which it used to be between the city and the rural area, became a border again. Which yeah, we found very interesting. Very yeah. Land. yeah, a no man's land. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah, it became a no man's land. And here's like a, a picture from um, yeah. the 60s when the Berlin Wall was erected. So after the Second World War, for more than 15 years, there was just the buffer zone. And then this kind of was meant, uh, kind of enforced uh, by the Berlin Wall. So this is all the area that we've been working in. So I'm just showing you all these pictures because I want you to understand the project that I'll show you later that we realize on that space a bit better. Um, <clears throat> so this will look like after the Berlin Wall came down because of unclarified ownership issues, you know, it just became a dumpster. Nobody took care for this kind of space. And um, it basically, well, here's an, um, another picture how it looked like. And then it became a parking lot until then um, <clears throat> there were fences uh, uh, built around it, and then it could become a green spot. 2006, we came and we just declared it the Skulpturen Park. You know, we set up a sign saying, welcome to Skulpturen Park. We did it in the way that basically um, also the advertising is presented here on a regular billboard for advertising. So that's how we advertise the spot. Then we invited various artists. So we basically played curators in the very beginning. We invited artists to um, realize projects and we did projects ourselves. I'm just gonna, we did about 40 projects. I can't show you all of them. I don't wanna take all your time today, but I'll show you like a few of them, um, which are paradigmatic how we work. So for example, Volker Köpperling and Martin Kalpasa, who we invited, they dug into the ground. And what they did basically, they just took uh, um, some tools and to just find out what is down there, you know, because people in the area didn't realize that, you know, that this has a very heavy history. And they dug uh, platforms into the ground. Now these platforms, um, I'll come to that later, are um, a reference to other platforms that used to exist to overview the wall. I'll show you. Um, <clears throat> so, and also what they did, they did some research about who actually lived there before and in the old telephone books, I don't know, you know, you can see who by name lived in which street. So they actually knew that they were digging into the cellar of um, Mr. Nachtigal, the um, Mielhand, or up here. So they were actually digging into his cellar and displayed kind of this knowledge as part of their exhibition. And then they had these platforms down there. So you were standing in the former cellar of these people. 
the reference of this construction is this. These platforms that you used to have to look over the wall, have a view you know, from West Germany to East Germany, because you weren't, it wasn't so easy to get over the wall. So at least you could read your uh, relatives and, and see them from these platforms. And the artist uh, and the artists, they actually were in Berlin and they did a little, they did a um, collection of pictures with these platforms. So I have a few of these here. And what all they did, they trans took this platform and dug it into the ground. So this is like one project, just you know, which has a historical reference to the space, mm -hmm. to you know, open <coughs> people's minds to you know the history of the space, to make them understand better what history is. Another project that dealt with the history is uh, a project called Neuen Hansen, which happened there, um, <coughs> and which dealt with the various paths that you find on this wasteland, the sculpture. But there are very various paths. For example. The border control paths that used to be there, and they still existed when we arrived there. You know, you'd still have this kind of asphalt, you know, of where this used to be, and this is what it used to look like. I have another picture that visualizes that. So, <clears throat> and up here, this is like another aerial view of uh, the sculptural park. So this is a border path, and then there are other paths also because there's like dog owners, for example, which also create paths on wastelands very important group of people in, as pioneer users from, for wastelands. And the artist, um, <coughs> Gekosch and Frank Metzger, what they did is they basically asked the kind of contemporary border controllers, uh, Securitas, to walk alongside these former paths every day and, con and in order to control the area. So. Um, what they did, they, set, um, they came yeah, out every day, uh, they set up their kind of mobile secure thing, and then the border, uh, the Securitas guy had to walk, it was his job, he was paid for it by us, uh, he had to walk this path of dog owners, of the border, border control, um, <coughs> and control paths, and then, um, and had to write a diary about this every day. Nothing happened. He just brought <laughs> <laughs> This went on for six weeks. It was a good project. So for six weeks, every day he came, he scanned, then he arrived. There's a protocol. And uh. then he walked alongside this kind of path and he wrote a diary. Which was a very banal project actually. But I was really I really, really like this project because you know it kind of also created an awareness for the history of that space. Now, here's another project on the Skulptur Park, um, which has a different angle, which is, has a more contemporary angle. And how did you manage to make people pay you for this? <laughs> well, you know, I'm doing the next time. Good, that's a good <laughs> you know, um, the way that we did it is like we said, okay, we want to do all these projects on this space, and we invite uh, various artists. We didn't know which projects they were going to do. And we had a list of names that, you know, were potentially going to do projects. And those artists that we invited and ourselves, you know, we have a portfolio. So basically this portfolio thing convinced them the, uh, the donors uh, that they shall give us some money. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this project um, is a, um, looks like regular uh, advertising. An advertising box, not totally unfamiliar in Berlin. The reality is, it's um, actually something that you can go underneath, and then you uh, open uh, the door, and you get into a fully equipped two-star hotel um, <laughs> with everything that you need to, you know, to, for it to be a two-star hotel: king-size bed, reading material, television, bathroom, everything. And we develop uh, an online booking system for that and um, advertise that single room hotel on the wasteland and it was booked out immediately because it was, it was very very cheap why was it so cheap because 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 of the advertising the advertising co-financed the um the hotel only disadvantage no windows but people didn't mind people just didn't mind which was you know it was very clear this is a, a hotel without windows it is financed by co-financed by <laughs> and we kind of like this kind of, you know, comment on on recent developments in yeah. uh, in, in urban 
areas. Now, I'm going back to this picture because I was mentioning um, the I was mentioning the pioneers of wastelands and uh, dog owners. Very important. Yes. Here you see dogs. Even back then, you would have dogs as pioneers for you know rural areas. <clears throat> and still today, on wastelands in cities, dog owners, very normal people, will become illegal citizens. You know, they will cross fences. They will do illegal stuff for so they can walk their dogs and you know let their dogs off the leash. It's very interesting how dog owners become very sort of because they are usually normal people. You know, they wouldn't break the law, but there they do. And it's really interesting because they're the first people that you know go onto wastelands and start using them in different ways. Mm -hmm. So Valeska Peschke, an artist, had been invited. She, she came up with the idea of uh, making a monument, uh, a memorial for these pioneers, the dog owners. And there's a story to that, which is a very interesting story. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know that story. It's like the yeah, Spanish yeah. Toro, which is actually uh, the logo of the brandy uh, brand called Osborne. And all alongside the Spanish highways, there was advertising, ding, 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 ding. And then there was a law saying, or the basic politicians decided, oh, you can't see the landscape anymore, all this advertising has to be taken down, so you can see the Spanish landscape again. Then there was a, a general outcry saying, like, no, this has become an icon of, of Spain. It, it has to stay. So basically, Osborne, the company, would only be allowed to let it if they would take down all their typography, everything that came with this thing, saying like this Osborne, you know, stripped down to the silhouette. Everything else went away. And this kind of private icon, Osborne, became a public icon by, you know, by public demand, which we thought, in reference to also the private spaces that we have here in the Skulpturen Park, these are all private lots, you know, and, you know, being turned public again, with, you know, we found that an interesting idea. So we like the reenactment of that mm -hmm. on the Skulpturen Park. Ah, this is also a really interesting project. Um, I'm just not going to show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we find yeah, time. Was interesting. We're running out of time. I don't know what I'm for you. And, yeah, we need some uh, space for discussion. All right. 2008, we, there was a paradigm shift in the work that we did because until then we were staying under the radar. Basically, there was no big public attention. We had our scene, seeing the projects that we did, but there was no like public that actually really knew what we were doing. And then there was the Berlin Biennial, which has become a kind of art event, I would say, in a bigger scale. And that asked whether they could use the Skulptur Park as a venue for their art. And we uh, agreed and said, okay, you can do that. And um, they also asked us what we could do uh, a piece there, whether we could realize a the work there, which we did. And then we, what we did is we took the sponsorship of BMW, because BMW was the sponsor, and basically all the VIPs came by in the BMWs, so it was also a, a weird scene, you know, this wasteland, and people in high heels, in suits, walking across this really like muddy, dirty wasteland, and dog shit everywhere, very strange, but also very funny, and we kind of like this contrast of this kind of ritzy art world, and sort of our rough approach towards, you know, what art can also be. So this is what we did with this sponsorship, and I hope this works. Of cars, you know, um, pulling each other 
We set up a pirate radio station. We played a song, This Land is Your Land, by Woody Guthrie, onto the radios of these cars. So it became a very interesting sound effect. And people uh, could actually take a ride. You can see people sitting in the back. Take a ride and travel for the length of that song in the car. And then, you know, people go out and. and so it became a carousel, but it also, for us, became a comment, of course, to uh, the uh, future of that land and the possible, you know, there's many possible futures for this land. And this is like something that we wanted people to kind of uh, um, think about. Now there's a, another really interesting uh, side story for the Berlin Biennium. Identity. Um, so by the Berlin Biennial, they didn't do such a good job, I think, uh, in, in how they curated their show. Basically what they did, they didn't care about the history of the space and all the users of the space and all that. And they dropped their skulls. In the background you can see this white thing. But overnight, everything, people came by and erected a little sculpture. <coughs> really interesting. Amazing. Really amazing. Yeah, it became a huge collection. Like, we the, the common people, hmm? the common people. The common people just <laughs> entered, decide, you know, mm, set up something. Probably just by you know knowing this is the Skulpturen Park, you know, it's like oh, I, I'm a sculptor too, I can do that. Okay, so they came, and then, oh, they <laughs> so it was amazing. I mean, really up to very complex uh, things, and and. <laughs> Now, what happened, we researched a little bit and we found YouTube clips of people <laughs> doing it and commenting on what they're doing. So they're like, okay, they're now putting this here, <laughs> and you know, it's like why they are doing this. Really interesting. And um, so suddenly common people, not artists, just anybody, you know, can like, okay, this is, it's not observed, there's no security, it's, it's not intimidating, it's not a white cube. I can do it. I mean, so, you know, there's not just one video, it's like various videos <laughs> that we found for that. Following the Berlin Bayern, there was, um, <coughs> uh, we were part of a uh, competition, an architectural competition for the Struktur Park. Uh, we, because it was like that. It was like, uh, we heard there's going to be an architecture or a city planning competition for the whole area. And we said, well, actually, you have to make us part of this, because we've been working here for three years, we know that space. And so we kind of forced ourselves into that competition. And we had various approaches of uh, neighborhood involvement to the inviting different stakeholders in the city, like from investment, uh, um, com investing companies to, you know, guerrilla gardening people and so on. And bring them on the same table and find out what actually could be developed here. And one thing that we found out actually is that there was a huge lack of representation for the actual users of that wasteland. Mm -hmm. And that's what we uh, created uh, uh, by uh, creating a bigger ritual for these users. So uh, what we did we basically uh, invited all these groups, dog owners um, and BMX kids, you know, the BMX guy, uh, bikes, guerrilla gardening, um, kitas, like kindergartens, which are using these, this space also, other artist groups. We invited them to be part of a big ceremony at, uh, to give them representation. This is what was left behind the day later. So for all of these, each of these groups, um, we developed a flag. We we wrote, composed a, a hymn, a song. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, created a slogan, like simple slogan, like this is what we want. And um, and we basically did this a ceremony of raising the flag, playing a hymn, showing the slogan. We did the ceremony with all eleven groups that we found. And we filmed it in the same way that it is usually filmed if you have big sports events, camera crane and tracks and all that kind of madness to make it look uh, shiny and nice. 
So we had really bad weather, but it didn't matter because we had 11 groups. They really had big interests of, for their representation. So they all came together. And basically, <laughs> we raised the flag, played the hymn. There was like this platform here. And then you would, uh, they would all stand together on that platform. And like also at the Olympic openings, you know, you also have this in bigger scale. You know, you show some kind of slow. So this ritual happened 11 times. Shape the slope again, and you know, eventually we had kind of this uh, collection of various slopes that were developed by the groups themselves. You know, we were just basically the moderators of this process, we were just facilitating and helping them in doing it. But actually, you know, all the slopes came from them, and also they did, did the graphics and all that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so finally, we did have the video, um, you can see the crane here in the background, it's, so it became a, a kind of piece, a, 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 a film, which uh, um, is, you can see it on YouTube, and which can be, which just, you know, created a visibility for the activities, which didn't exist before. All right, um, oh, this is also a really nice piece, um, <laughs> this is awkward to say about your own piece, like, wow, this is a really beautiful piece. <laughs> Great. But uh, just very quickly, this is the last piece that we did on Skulptur and Park, and then I'll show you two more projects that we did outside of Skulptur and Park. The last piece is called Land's End, last piece. <coughs> and what you can see here is burn cars. Burn cars in Berlin, very familiar thing. Every day, in average, a car burns in Berlin. And there's a huge discussion about whether that is a political act, you know, a statement against gentrification and upgrading of the city, because usually it's SUVs that burn, or, or commercial cars. And, or whether that is just pure vandalism by crash kids. We didn't want to make a statement on that. We just wanted to, you know, just uh, uh, find out what the dynamic is in this. So what we did, we placed these cars in this little town park. We got these burned cars from like the car dumpsters. And then we wrote an opera for this. And the Lens and Opera, we took kind of popular opera songs and, um, yeah, and, libretto, yeah. and then we wrote a new libretto. And the new libretto were, were quotes by investors, by citizens, by uh, real estate uh, agents, by activists, artists, and city planners. So this libretto, each song represented one of these six characters. And these, this opera was placed in the cars. You know, we had loudspeakers in the cars. And it could be, you know, you could hear it 24-7 over three weeks. And I play it to you. Unfortunately, the sound here is not so good, but... Just go. 
Yes. Um, maybe just, I don't know, what time is it right now? Uh, half an hour left until tea break, so we have half an hour to discuss. Yeah, we can discuss stuff. <laughs> There's plenty of more projects from other places, but maybe we can also well, discuss the audience. Some Half an hour. Uh, one other project. Well, well, yeah. 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 one more. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Okay, Jakarta Bayou. Very but recent project. Very yeah. simple yeah. and quickly uh, uh, explained. Yeah. yeah. We were invited to Jakarta Bayou, which has a new curatorial board, which is a really interesting uh, board. They wanted to invite artists to actually do. Yeah things in public space, which is kind of uh, difficult. It's kind of chaotic in Jakarta. And um, they invited us to do a project at Senin Market. Senin Market is a traditional market in the center of Jakarta, very old, with a huge diversity of products and services from more than 100 years ago. But in the 80s and now in the early 21st century, there were two development kind of uh, um, shifts um, for kind of more contemporary uh, shopping. So in the 80s, there was like the first kind of shopping mall, which is still a little bit like the old market, mm -hmm. uh, like a bazaar, but you know, becoming more clean and um, there's more light. I mean, now they have a really like typical global shopping mall also next to that. So you have like three areas, I would say, you know, the old traditional market with this great variety of products. Then you have kind of the, this 80s uh, idea of cleaning this kind of, because these bazaars are very chaotic, yeah. very uh, chaotic, very loud, very dirty, but very fascinating. And then, so the 80s version was kind of the clean version of that and now the 21st century version is sort of global brands. The stuff that I know from basically the Alexa here, I can buy that too. It's actually <coughs> incredibly boring. I have to say, from my point of view, going to Indonesia and seeing all the same brands that I see here, it's just like a waste of time. So <clears throat> we decided to uh, uh, also create some representation for the old market because this is, the plan is, the city planning is take down the old market Sell, get up some new uh, global shopping malls because they're you know investors have interest they you know push and uh, and so we wanted to create some representation for that so we walked through this old market and we came across some some material which we thought is kind of unique to these old markets packaging for example you, everything you know is packaged into small individual packages you know it's not like the you're kind of coming out of the factory, all the same package, it's all in really packed. Really fascinating, it has certain, in, in the fabric they use also has a certain meaning, so there's codes for the fabric, and, <clears throat> and of course cardboard boxes. And we wanted to basically bring some elements of that together with typical elements of, you know, your postmodern shopping mall, or, <coughs> um, also, stadium architecture we're thinking of. Why stadium architecture? I will show you in a second. This cube, or you see it here like in a hockey stadium, was something I really got interested in when we saw the space that we wanted to work in on the market because it had a stadium feel. Oh, yeah. This is the market. And it is, it has, it, it's like a stadium more or less. It's incredibly crowded, there's a lot going on everywhere. And, and people really, actually people that work there really like the place, they really identify with it. And also in the city there is a sentiment that actually we like this market quite a lot. You know, they, they like the market because it has this great diversity. And <clears throat> so we wanted, so we took this element which usually you find in super domes, a cube, and we build it out of the material that we found for, found for packaging. Wow. You know, you see, so you see here you know, all this uh, uh, material and the cardboard boxes with a certain German regularity. <laughs> <laughs> <They're> absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, we can change that originally. So it has to, it had to be in a certain order. Um, but, um, and it basically the cube says seven. Seven means Monday, so it's the Monday market. So if you, you know, if we want to create an icon. An icon, sort of like, or like a logo for the seven market for it to become more visible. And so basically, this is what we did within like 10 days. We didn't have so much time to do it, but, um, and the people really liked it because I identified with that space a lot. And they really loved that we came from the outside and we said, yeah, we also like it. And we want to create an icon that, you know, for other people, uh, the market becomes more visible and acknowledged as a place of like, diversity. Yeah, so that is like the this point that we did last uh, fall. Yeah. Enough. Thank you for your theoretical approach. And then you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, let me. Uh, thank you, Matthias. That was nice. Uh, have you thought about doing one for, for an actual model shopping mall? And a modern shopping mall. Mm. That would be quite I have different. A for you. Yeah, no, it could be quite interesting. Yeah. Because it's always about juxtaposing. You know, juxtaposing. Yeah. In the in the yeah, right. case, showing, the showing up the, yeah. the differences. Exactly. Mm. No. The 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 problem with these postmodern malls is of course there is a sameness to them. Yeah. So if you want to create place attachment as a precondition for identity, right, you know, my shopping mall, right? Yeah. Why do I go there? Not because it's same, I go there because of something else. Yeah. And, and uh, so uh, let's talk because I might have a project for you. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, good. So, um, but we're doing like this now. I'm answering Matthias's question, he answers mine, okay? So if you ask me, he answers. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this is a, hey, listen, you do those kinds of projects, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we're fine. We're okay, I can okay. understand. We're fine, we're standing too much. We're even sitting too much. Yeah. Okay, all right, so questions. Any questions to Matthias about my, my earlier talk? <laughs> yeah, my fullest comments, yeah. Um, you use the word identity a lot, which is kind of a container that can mean many things. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, patchwork, mm -hmm. multi-layered? What, what, what do you understand to be identity? Identity. Well, it's a big container for a lot of things. You know, you can identify with a nation state, you can identify with a locality, you can identify with anything. I think what we're talking more about is about local um, identification, less place. about sort of pla place. Place, exactly. So, you know, there I would narrow it down. And we are really interested, like, in, in our projects, in the physical identity, you know, like, the yeah. physically being there on the spot. That's a kind of important <coughs> thing, the social interaction with people. I, but at the same time, I, I do acknowledge that there is also other ways of identifying uh, in, in the digital world. Uh, uh, th thank you, multi-layered was the right thing to say. We actually both used place attachment mm -hmm. as, as a kind of sort of falling in love and then, you know, we are in union with everybody else who's also falling in love with this place. My city, etc. But uh, of course, you're right, it's multi-layered. It's like falling in love. What do you fall in love for? And that falling in love and the experiences that you have from that love affair then create desirable behavior, right? You look after the kids, you make sure everything is okay and so on and so on. So that's what you want to do for a city. And I, I was very, and, and in many ways, you know, I thought, what is this thing where we have a dialogue, uh, you know, and what do I do with this strange person? And I'm falling in love with them. No. So, <laughs> so that's nice. So, um, but you're right, it's multi-layered. Um, and I think we perhaps need new ways to create this for the cities. The challenge is to see which layers are there, which ones can we use, and probably place identity, let's say for Berlin, does not need to have a sameness. You know, why, why do people love Berlin? 
right? I have several friends who love the lint for totally different things. Some like it because because it's a place, I have one friend who likes Berlin because it's a place full of waterways and she goes on a boat and it's the best place in the world to go on a boat. I have friends who like this place because, uh, because it has affinity groups which are tolerated in an urban spirit. You know, so you know, if, 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 it, it's no uh, great secret that uh, the big cities, Cologne and Berlin are places to express sexual preferences and not be noticed, right? <laughs> Particularly. Um, and so, 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 so there are different ways that turn this into my city. I have a book which I like a lot and I wish I'd written it. Uh, <laughs> but I probably only have it as a user. It's called Which is My City? And the book says no, the, the book gives certain categories to different cities and it makes me think, and, and, and the challenge of the book is to say, uh, uh, it, it's, 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 it's along the lines of a book, a book in the UK uh, which is called Which Colour is Your Parachute? Mm -hmm. Which is a career finding thing. So which colour is your city, right? Which is my city? And it says certain cities have, uh, uh, are known for certain things, right? So if you, uh, and, and Perhaps identity is tied to those things, so it's a multi-faceted thing. Yeah. So, for example, it also tells you, of course, uh, and, and one wishes terribly to be uh, at most 21 years old, and with 20 years of experience, of course. Um, but you know, it tells you which cities are best for you in certain stages of your life. If, if you're single and uh, want to do a lot of dating, no better place than New York, because the place is full of people who are single and want to do dating. If uh, uh, you want a job? No, 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 no more, no more New York. Uh, if you're in the tech field, go to Silicon Valley. If you're bringing up kids, you should urgently move to Toronto or Vancouver because those are great family places, right? So, uh, sit, and, and, and there's probably subsets of that which you have yeah. found here. Absolutely, yeah, we couldn't agree more. It, there, there's like, um, I mean, also in the project, I guess you could see there's like, uh, you know, like, you know, these eleven groups that were on wastelands. That different I groups? Know. Yeah, 11 different groups. Different groups, You, you yeah. find them on the perimeter of a, of a wasteland. Yeah. And they are, uh, and, and sometimes people, you, you know, they the use the space, group? but they don't even know. Ah, 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 ah. Wanted to change group also? Loyalty changes to, to, to hmm? Did they also want to change groups? Because, I mean, you can okay, be a dog owner them. and somebody that wants to have a picnic on the street. Once they no. Yeah, but the thing is, they realize at that point that mm -hmm. they have the same interest, mm -hmm. you know, that they identify with that yeah, that's they, they didn't know before. That's one facet of the identity they have, that they yeah. might be both street picnic lovers and dog owners. Mm -hmm. and and that but but the thing I found interesting yeah. about this particular project was that all of a sudden, you have, you know, in essence, when you have urban wasteland, you think, you know, what kind of building is going to be here? But suddenly, the interesting thing was that you found, you actually found place attachment in the most unlikely places. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly found that this worthless piece of wasteland uh, uh, had, uh, uh, had an identity creation bit uh, for all these 11 groups. Yeah. And, uh, and who would have thought, you know? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have thought so. When, when looking for the group, suddenly there were 11 groups. Yeah. yeah. Well, but by the way, this will have yeah. more questions because we have, I think, uh, about, about 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And yeah, it's, I think it's approximately over to more questions. Yeah. How long before a corporation moves in and tries to redevelop the place? What's the future of the place? Of oh, that space? Yeah. Different futures. Um, <clears throat> One half of that land is owned by um, the private owners, mm -hmm. and they claim monopoly, which means they, in the beginning when we started working there, there's like 11 different, no, 11, 12 different owners. By the end, after f uh, five years, there were only three owners, you know, so you yeah. accumulate the lots, become, they become more valuable. Mm -hmm. So, and now, 
um, there are two investors and they're investing on the whole lot. So it's a big construction site. The other side, which we were involved in the architectural competition that I mentioned earlier, is owned by the Liegenschaftsfonds, which is like a sort of public, it's public land, it's public, but it's public. administrated by a company, but it's public land anyhow. Okay. So there is a political decision what to happen, what shall happen with this. And it's, they're still sort of, you know, doing, uh, how to say, well, they're still thinking about it. Let's say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a question here. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a general question, but um, giving an example of a specific uh, yes. thing. Um, if you have a context, that um, of a village that has very distinct historical stories and images, yes. but then they are sort of sick of this image and they want to show that they are also modern people and they are living in this era. So what, how can you solve this? With great difficulty. Yeah. We, can, we have, a, we have a, um, one problem that we have uh, is that Heritage, as we perceive it, changes changes a great deal when it comes in contact with other value systems. Uh, we have several we have several uh, instances. For example, one particular instance in China, where a, a remote village has become totally Disneyfied. So, in, uh, to the extent that uh, the, 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 the village life. Uh, uh, <laughs> during the day and it all shuts down at 1800 hours when the museum shuts down, right? It's a, a very difficult, so um, very early on, it, it, it's well worth very early on, of course, you see, one, one thing is we can't escape this modern life and, and if we try to preserve something, we make it unnecessarily static and, and as soon as people are concerned, of course, that is impossible. You know, then you find one, you find the show group stays in the village and the other people move out to the next village and engage in modern life. Uh, so so uh, one thing that is always very difficult to gauge is how far you do, do you accept that people observe you, are with you, interact with you. And, the, and, and, and really, if you want to preserve some of that uh, without being too artificial, you have to restrict it. Just that way. Um, well, well, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, you have a village, as you were saying. Like, and the village doesn't want ide to, doesn't identify with, you know, their their traditions anymore. But actually, they do. They do. But but actually, the, the thing is, so within a community, you always have, I guess, various interests, and they, you know, it's kind of complex. Ah. Very complex. But so yes, you have like my, my, my thing. The, the only uh, the, sometimes value systems coexist, are uh, apparently contradict each other, and yet they're all right. You know? It, 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 yeah, yeah, and I guess in a functioning village, that yeah. would be the case. Yeah. You would have contradicting but values. But we have, we have, have these even within ourselves, you know? Yeah. We have these right. within ourselves, yeah. right? And I think that's kind of. You would never have an entire village saying like we don't want this anymore. You have like conflicting, conf yeah. conflicting interests. But then youngsters that say like come on, all these traditions. Then you have more conservative people. You know, it's yeah. all and micro here, scale. Micro scale. Uh, just look at my uh, last slide. We need to find forms of civic collaboration. So they may take. I mean, I, I, I like Matthias's uh, 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 way of expressing these as artistic projects. They may take such forms. Because sometimes enactments, uh, 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 showcasing, uh, playing with each other, theatre type stuff mm -hmm. is possible. But we certainly need uh, new forms of engaging in such communities and bringing such issues to the fore. You know, the, the, uh, very often they're, they're kept quiet and nobody talks about them. But we need to, uh, as heritage professionals, we need to find ways to create civic engagement and to uh, accelerate discussions and to make discussions public. Mm -hmm. And th there are different forms for that. If there's a more head-bound form and there's a more stomach-bound form. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're talking about some participation of the social, uh, socialistic point of views. I mean, uh, the, uh, the neighbor should be participated or something like that, Always. in these cases. 
Yeah. It's not my comment, but I, what I'm thinking, I'm really jealous about something because we have West Ends, but I'm thinking about my country, Dhaka. So, uh, is it full of people? No West Ends, I mean, no open lands up there. Yeah. If you have uh, uh, just a piece of open lands, go for the real estate and something like that. Yes. So, uh, yes, uh, this is all about with the context. Mm. Because, uh, we, yes, uh, one of my friends have talked, uh, talked about, about the material layering of the uh, ideas and how you are going to uh, manipulate the whole things together. Mm -hmm. So for, for, for country like my, my country, like Bangladesh uh, or Dhaka, so uh, I want to see really, because maybe we will discuss about this later, but how we can do this? Because those things is really worse. Uh, it it, it is me, working, because let me explain. it doesn't, yes sir. That's, 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 I mean, I'm taking the word segregation. Yeah. It is very important to me to look at the use of spaces. We, in, in, in the modern city, we need spaces that are not segregated. Yeah. I mean, segregated by race, color, yeah. income, uh, 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 provenance, uh, yeah. caste, etc. Exactly. We need spaces where people can meet and, you know, in, in the most banal way. I mean, where you and I can meet in the space yeah. in Dhaka, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, or, or uh, where <coughs> even in a socially acceptable form, genders can meet, uh, uh, whatever, right? Yeah. But, uh, or different uh, yeah. strata of society. Uh, yes. So, so we have. We, we, I, I find in my uh, research that the use of communal space is actually a pacifying and very beneficial influence on cities. And, uh, mm -hmm. and nothing is more destructive than concreting the whole place over. Yes. Nothing, and, 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 and but so even, let me uh, uh, tell you a few ideas that I've developed with people who run large buildings uh, in, in Europe. Even when you have no official spaces outside your buildings, you start to create spaces for encounters of people who live in these spaces, you create encounter spaces. You artificially uh, accelerate dialogue. I, I have a, a, a new scheme um, that there, are, that there is some high density uh, uh, living also in Germany. And we're thinking, um, and these are the owners and managers of these buildings, we're thinking of recreating the concierge idea, meaning somebody who looks after the building uh, as a sort of um, uh, Service. Yeah. So, so you suddenly, you know, you suddenly have somebody who can go to say, where can we play football as a, uh, you know, the kids? Uh, where can we put our bikes so they're safe? Um, uh, where, where can we jog? Who else in the building is interested in uh, playing tennis with me? Sorry, um, yeah. I think yeah, we're running out of time, and unfortunately, we don't have. Uh, maybe you have quickly comments on that question, like one minute, and. Or no, actually, then, then, um, I think um, it has said most uh, yeah. important things. And it's, you know, the communal spaces are this kind of. That's the question I'm thinking about. Just the no worry. Because the European cities and the. Uh, <laughs> especially the South Asian one, actually. Yes. It's very complicated, you know. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work, really. Next suggestion. Challenge. Yeah, challenge. So work, my friend. Yeah, and, 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 just work. Yeah. <laughs> it says something that it belongs. Make some space for your belonging. Or make people belong or something like that. Yes. Oh, yeah. On that, 